walked up here, people would begin to take their seats. Good afternoon, my name is Jonah Willengans. I am the um, director of the Stanford Storytelling Project, which is a new arts program at Stanford that offers courses, hosts live events, makes grants, and produces a radio show, a lot like This American Life, uh, that features stories by Stanford students, alumni, faculty, staff, fellows, anybody in any way associated with Stanford. If you came here and had lunch at Stanford 10 years ago, you're eligible. So, um, I want to thank Steve Weitzman and Marie Pierre for inviting me to uh, do this introduction and to collaborate with them. Another thing that the Storytelling Project does is collaborate and co-host and co-sponsor events like these. And I just think that um, as soon as I learned from Marie-Pierre and Steve that they were doing this conference with some live events, I was very excited. Largely because I don't know a ton about Jewish storytelling. I know kind of the average amount for an American. Um, so I've already been learning and I'm looking forward to tomorrow and tonight. Um, I have long been a fan of the gentleman I get to introduce, uh, Josh Kornbluth. I just mentioned to him that um, right around the time his feature film that he made with his brother, Jacob, uh, Haiku Tunnel came out, which was 01 or 02, I think. I had recently done a stint of temping in San Francisco before I went to graduate school, and it spoke uh, directly to my experience. So um, if any of you have not seen this film, I think it's on iTunes uh, and get it on DV. It's very, very funny. Uh, it's um, very much the kind of uh, humor and pathos that you can expect from Josh. I want to just let you know that his, um, did, have any of you listened to Red Diaper Baby or seen the concert film of it? Yeah. If you haven't, I highly recommend it. It's an audio book. Uh, it features all of his early work. So he started doing uh, monologues based, uh, autobiographical monologues in 1989. And a lot of that early work is in the audio book. And it's also a concert film. And there's a second concert film called um, The Mathematics of Change. And both of those are on DVD. I would recommend both. And um, his latest show, which we're gonna, I think, have either an entirety or an excerpt of, excerpt of, um, sea of Reeds is something that uh, is going to open up at the Ashby Theater in July in Berkeley. So if you'd like to see more of his live work, watch for that in July. Josh lives in Berkeley with his wife and his son, and we're very, very happy to have him here. So please join me in welcoming Josh Humble. <laughs> I should really, I just, I, I mean, I think, if I may, wow, you're, you've got the, well, discounted sort of, yeah, uh, yeah, you, because, you know, the seats that are, you're blocked from seeing the performer, but I know it was slightly cheaper, and, <laughs> and I know we're, many of us are on a budget, so that's cool, I'll try not to, well, then this, wow, that would be, well, that would be sort of mysterious. Um, the thing that I, I can add to my bio, uh, but only as of a few weeks ago, is that I'm also, I'm a, I am official. I have the letter. I'm I'm a visiting lecturer at Stanford University, and uh, it's pretty. I mean, it's not Cal, but it's pretty impressive. And uh, well, what did I say? What? Um, and yeah, I've been teaching a class uh, called the Ethics of Storytelling, and we have uh, just uh, two more uh, two more weeks to go. And next Wednesday, this is not this Wednesday, the following Wednesday, my students are going to tell their autobiographical stories. And then we're going to attack our own stories as being unethical and uh, <laughs> go into other fields. That's the, uh, um, that's the plan. That's because uh, I, I, it was co-sponsored by, I know storytelling ethics I'm not really that familiar with, and, uh, but it was co-sponsored by the Ethics in Society uh, program, and so I felt that ethics should be included in the, in the you know, title and uh, description. Uh, However, you know, I, I wasn't really even sure if ethics is technically singular or plural, and uh, which is, in and of itself is a weird ethical problem that you would wonder about that, you know? Uh, it, it's, it may be immoral. Um, anyhow, here we are. Uh, this, is, this is not, uh, this, I, I'm work, I'm, I 
I'm doing, I do monologues, which is weird, because you'd think I could talk better. Uh, <laughs> but a lot of my impact is just from my physical presence, and the talking is really just sort of gravy. Uh, <laughs> Uh, at least that's what my wife tells me. So this is, um, let's see, I hope, I hope, I, I haven't seen the other talks, but I hope I'm following the similar tone to all the talks so far uh, in this uh, conference. So I, 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 I don't drive, so I rode my bike here, and I followed, uh, in my phone, I had a little GPS thing, and, um, you know, I was just thinking, you know, it'd be cool in Exodus, you know, if they had had, you know, GPS. Uh, it would, Although it would have been, it would have been, been much shorter uh, and uh, perhaps less interesting, which is actually, and then I got lost. The GPS kept sending me out to the highway, uh, the freeway, um, probably some sort of anti-Semitic uh, device. Uh, it's an Android, so you can't really tell because they just stare at you, but uh, this isn't really helping, is it? Okay, um, let me go into this uh, Sea of Reeds thing. Um, thank you for that introduction. That was so far the highlight, I think. Uh, <laughs> of my presentation. Um, a sea of reeds. Uh, hey, hi. Go, cool. that's a really good friend of mine. Uh, as are, are several who, whom I've already greeted, and you are no less friends of mine. Uh, and those who, can I just say also this, is there anyone here, I mean, just what are the odds that there wouldn't be, but are there people here who speak Hebrew? Are there not Hebrew? Okay, oh, that's awesome. Okay, now this, I don't wanna take up your time, but I, I'm just, I'm available. I could use someone to speak Hebrew to me because I've been learning Hebrew as part of my Jewish studies, which I just started in the last couple of years. I've been learning Hebrew from a recording, a Pimsler. It's a, a spam uh, thing that you get <laughs> spammed with. And, and it's usually like there's a picture of a beautiful woman and it says, learn Hebrew. You know, and the thing is, you know, I mean, the Hebrew, again, is sort of bonus. And then, uh, <laughs> and then I'm, so I was learning and I've been learning while I wash dishes and while I do the laundry, which is, Excellent for my wife because I actually then wash the dishes and do the laundry because I have to listen to my Hebrew every day. And I have been learning Hebrew. I'm up to, I just finished uh, chapter 13, 15 out of like a million. And, um, and so I've been speaking Hebrew, but with nobody. Just nobody, you know, because I'm the only one in my building who speaks Hebrew and in my family. And, and so I have no idea if I'm speaking correctly or if it's just a, a scam. You know, if they've actually been teaching, you know, teaching me Romanian, and then, I mean, Shalom seems Hebrew. I mean, that one rings true, but okay, let me just do, I'm just going to say something briefly in Hebrew. Just want to see if it sounds sort of semi-authentic, and then we get on with my story. I'm going to try to do something a little, uh, this is relatively complex, uh, f uh, as of chapter 15. Uh, you know, not for you guys, but uh, um, okay. Ani rotse. Okay. Okay. Ani rotse lecho itach achshav. Or if if to him itcha, is that right? Itcha. Okay. Wow. Well, that's cool. Okay. Great. Well, I've gotten everything I wanted. Okay. This is. Uh, I have a commissioned piece, and it's going to open. Uh, it's going to open, and so the future of Jewish storytelling to me somewhat self-centered, uh, is, uh, it really is focusing on July. Uh, that's, uh, July is really as far as I'm thinking for Jewish storytelling. Uh, uh, also in terms of, I realize that there's sort of a new technology thing. There's, a, I saw an aspect in the description of the conference and, and so I want to propose that storytelling, Jewish storytelling, which in the past, of course, has been very much oral and then, and then it was written and, and, and both and I think, the, with the new technology will be transmitted primarily via the oboe uh, from, from now on. And, and I, I'm sure you have other talks about that. Um, the Sea of Reeds, and I'm gonna be honest with you because I feel that's really my only hope, uh, is the Sea of Reeds is a title that I came up with before I had an idea for the piece. Um, this is how it worked. I'm friends with a rabbi. I'm not bragging. Uh, although he's a great rabbi, probably could kick your rabbi's ass, uh, <laughs> theologically. And uh, also probably younger than your rabbi, he's very young, he's like 35 or 6 or 12 or something. But he's, uh, anyhow, I'm friends with this rabbi and I really love this rabbi. I just, he is just the nicest and he's just a really sweet guy. Plus he's sort of an atheist. Uh, well, I'm in Berkeley, so that's almost like redundant there, but it's, uh, 
but he's not an atheist. I mean, he believes in, in, in God, uh, but God to him, he describes, he defines God as the collective potential of the human imagination. That is his description. I might just take it for myself uh, and squeeze him out, but uh, that's his description. And what happened is that through my meeting this guy, Menachem, this rabbi, um, that what I am an, an atheist, uh, raised by communists in New York City uh, with a firm belief throughout my, until, until I was in my, 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 my mid-20s, I totally believed that there was going to be a communist revolution uh, in this country and in the world. And the only question, but the only difference between my parents politically was whether it would be in the world first or the United States, like where, which, where would, where, how it would go. And, 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 and I also believed very strongly and positively that the Soviet Union, when I was a teenager, I went to the Soviet Union and I was a teenager, a young teenager from the United States, a communist, who went to the Soviet Union believing that I was going to go to this place that was this socialist paradise in which everything that we had problems with here in America was, will have, would have been worked out. And so I would get to see sort of our future, our model for what we were going to um, be. And then I got there and I actually met my relatives in Leningrad, as it was, <laughs> it used to be called Leningrad, this goes back a ways, but uh, it was, uh, and they, uh, well actually, okay, they said certain things about Jews that implied that Jews weren't always treated that well in the Soviet Union. I knew that they were wrong <laughs> because I had my ideology and my ideology, had it was beautiful. And literally, I remember sitting there, sitting there with my relatives. This is my grandfather who'd left, I mean, he was, a, by the way, one side, this is my other side, I was, I'm close to the side that was pickpockets. My other side, rabbis, no connections. Uh, <laughs> and so this is my grandfather who was the pickpocket in the shtetl. Idil Zeldin, Julius, who became Julius Zeldin, a bad pickpocket, a slow pickpocket, unfortunately, who was caught all the time. He just kept being caught, repeatedly caught. And, uh, and he would go to jail, and then he would escape, because he was clever but slow. It, it's, uh, it's an interesting combination. And, uh, and he was then 20 years old, perhaps, as before the revolution, and, uh, uh, and he was in jail with a revolutionary who said, leave Russia. Uh, in retrospect, I don't know, you know if he just wanted to get rid of like, pickpockets and people like my grandpa, but he also taught him how to write in, uh, I think in, in Russian, and so he was able, my grandfather Julius was able to communicate to his sisters, uh, his four sisters, all of whom I met, uh, still, uh, they were then you know, older, as was he, because that's how time moves, uh, in the 70s. So anyhow, my grandfather was visiting from New York. Oh, so my grandfather came to New York, he sold rags, he sold hardware, and then he became a hardware salesman. He would go store to store selling hardware uh, to places, but also was a communist. Was, uh, and so he would drop off at the uh, hardware stores, he would drop off the Daily Worker, uh, which later became the Daily World, he would drop off at the hardware stores that he would drop off, you know, he, would, he would drop off free copies of the Daily Worker, uh, the Communist Party newspaper during the McCarthy period. And then uh, he was followed by two guys in suits uh, for like a month uh, until my grandma told them, stop following my husband or I'll call the police on you. And they did. It's weird, because you, you think of the McCarthy period as being a lot more onerous, and I'm sure it was, but uh, that is the extent of our persecution. <laughs> um, Grandpa bought me this oboe. No, he didn't, actually. He bought me another oboe, and this is the oboe that I've replaced it with. Uh, he made the money through uh, selling hardware. He, he kept working uh, till he was uh, 100. Uh, and then he lived 203 and uh, made a good case for uh, when you're young doing something like pickpocketing that, that is aerobically uh, <laughs> sound. <laughs> it costs $1,000. The oboe was a, a lore, unlike this one, it's a Laubin. Laubin's fine, it's fine, but the one my grandpa got me was a Loray, and Loray is the most beautiful, it's the standard, it's the, the Mozart of, I don't know, it's, oh, oh, I know, it's the, the you know, what's the, whatchamacallit, with violin, the Stradivarius, 
It's a Stradivarius, except they're, they're still there. You know, they're still going, they still make, I mean, it's, okay, here's what happened. I used to play the violin, and then um, I, w I was mugged. And uh, I was entering my mother's building, and uh, I was mugged. And uh, here, I'm going to reenact it. So, so I, I was entering, I was, got out of the cab with my stuff, I had musical stuff, because I had a friend I did music with, and I got out of the building, and then there were these teenagers, and they were walking just past, like this, and then they stopped, and then I thought, I remember thinking, wait, I should have asked the cab to stay until I went into, inside the building, but I didn't, and the cab went off, and then they turned, and they came back, and one of them held a knife to my throat, like, you know, held a knife to my throat, and he said, you know, give, a, give us your violin, or, or, or I'll cut your throat, and it, like, I mean, that's a no-brainer. I mean, that's not even, no one in the neighborhood wanted me to play the violin anymore. It wasn't, <laughs> I mean, it, it actually is just occurring to me now that it was a setup, uh, that actually, it was something, people all chipped in, and uh, they paid a number of youth actors uh, to uh, come in and to, uh, and to take my, uh, my violin. Because I've been terrible, when I practiced the violin, my mom would, well, this is also cruel, this doesn't reflect well on her, I have to say. But, uh, but she would say, she would, I would be practicing the violin as a little boy, and then she'd run into my room, and she'd go, squeak, 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 okay, like that. She'd say, squeak, 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 as I was playing. She'd say, squeak, squeak, squeak. So, oh, maybe it just strikes me as really mean. But uh, it, was, it wasn't supportive. Uh, and yet, no one, my father included, no one wanted me to keep playing the uh, violin after the violin was taken away, uh, no one. Um, it was actually returned, and still, uh, no, they did, they caught the guy, he was just walking down the street with a violin, and they said, oh yeah, but no, that's okay, you just keep going with that violin, we really would uh, like Josh to get onto another instrument. Now, why? Why did I have to play an orchestral instrument, and in my memory, in my mind, is because as a Jewish kid, you had to play an orchestral instrument, and I remember it was an orchestral instrument, because guitar, everyone played guitar, you were born playing guitar, you came out playing guitar, you know, or banjo, or they, at least my folk singing family, but an orchestral instrument, it was part of the culture, it was part of being cultured, that you would play an orchestral instrument, you go to an Ivy League school, you, you won a Nobel Prize, you, there were just certain things that, there were just certain benchmarks, and as long as you met them, you were not a, a total disappointment. Uh, and in my case, there was an added, there was an added layer, there was an added thing that was, uh, uh, it was I was supposed to lead the revolution, I was supposed to lead a communist, violent communist revolution, in the United States, um, and my father would say over and over, he'd say, uh, "Not necessarily in my lifetime, but but in yours." He would say to me. It would, so you know, it gave me some time, you know, uh, to lead a revolution. <laughs> and this was—I was born in '59, so this is—I grew up. I was a teenager. I would have had my bar, my bar, bar mitzvah had I been bar mitzvah uh, at the usual age of 13. I would have had my bar mitzvah in 1972. Uh, wow, me and Nixon. So it would have been, it would have been cool, but it never occurred, would have occurred to us because our kinds of Jews, our, the kinds of Jews we were, we were uh, ultra secular. You know, we were, I mean, communists. We were communists. I mean, and now here's the thing that I will tell you, and this is one reason why you'll see why I'm really drawn to this rabbi, okay, because I told him when I first met him, I said, look, my father told me, my mom would always quote, you know, religion is the opiate of the masses. That's what Karl Marx said, religion is the opiate of the masses. And then he immediately says, but you know the rest of that sentence. <laughs> I was like, no, you know. Uh, well, the rest of the sentence is, and I'm maybe slightly paraphrasing here, but Marx, Karl Marx said, Karl Marx, whose father had in order to assimilate, well, I guess, yeah, that's a pretty effective way is to stop being Jewish. Uh, he uh, converted the family. Uh, Karl Marx wrote, Religion is the opiate of the masses. And he also said something like, it is the heart in a heartless world. I mean, it follows, that follows, that follows immediately after that. That is a bit of context. That's a tremendous bit of context. No one mentioned that. Someone mentioned it. When my father got ill, he had a stroke. And this is something, again, this is just a total coincidence, but let me just share with you guys. <clears throat> Today is March 3rd. March 3rd happened to be, by coincidence, my father's birthday. It was also the day on which, after my father had died, my stepmother suddenly died. Uh, and uh, 
So, and I have three siblings from their marriage. Uh, and so March 3rd is the day. Everyone's been sending emails around the world. March 3rd is the day. Now that's, so that's one thing. It's March 3rd and I think about my late stepmother. I think about my late father who had a stroke, which, which did him in. But then the other thing that happened just recently is one of my oboe teachers just died. Uh, I mean, I just had a few lessons with him. I didn't deserve him. But William Bennett, the principal oboist of the San Francisco Symphony Orchestra, William Bennett who had, shares the name with that unfortunate asshole, Bill Bennett, the neoconservative. And really, that's just my opinion. I know there might be people here from the Hoover Institute or whatever, but uh, <laughs> although what are the odds? Um, <laughs> Really. Um, but um, he uh, was playing uh, the Strauss Oboe Concerto. Uh, he was in the middle of playing it, and perhaps you've seen this or you, you read this or heard it. He was in the middle of playing this is last week, just last week, last weekend. Bill was playing uh, with the orchestra at the, uh, not with the San Francisco Symphony, but in front of, with the symphony, and, uh, and he collapsed. Uh, and it turns out he had a, a cerebral hemorrhage. As he was playing, he collapsed, and then, um, I couldn't pray for him because I don't believe in praying. I don't be, no, I, I believe in praying as an activity. I don't believe it as something that actually has a consequence. And so for me, all I could do was, was hope. And it didn't work. And he, he, he died. He died. Uh, 50, 56 years old, sweet guy. Um, he had a choice when he came out of college of either being a cartoonist for Disney or being an oboist for the San Francisco Symphony, just to give you a sense of his whimsicality. So anyhow, Bill Bennett is on my mind. Bill Bennett, with whom I had a couple of lessons, and, uh, and then my family members as well. And what I want to say about my family is that it was, it was a religion, as I realized, only after I started going to shul in the last couple of years, after I met Menachem and got drawn in, you know, like Al Pacino and... Godfather Three, except I hadn't been there originally, so it's a totally wrong analogy. Uh, it probably would work in Godfather Four. Uh, I um, I realized when I went to synagogue, when I went to shul, uh, that what I had been raised in is a religion. I felt I've been raised certainly in a faith. I certainly had faith. I had total and utter faith that history was moving in one direction, and that direction was towards the end of exploitation, the end of class conflict, the end of class, the end of suffering. And when I started going to shul, I heard some things that sounded familiar. Someone tried to not warn me, but tell me about this, and this was my father's friend. My father's best friend was named Chuck Yerkes, and he was a Presbyterian minister who was a Marxist um, with writer's block. Uh, he was writing his doctoral dissertation over the course of the entire time I knew him. Uh, he had a young doctoral advisor at Union Theological Seminary named uh, Cornell West. Uh, Cornell West, you, uh, you may well have seen him speak. He is perhaps the most self-possessed speaker in the history of speaking. But I went up to him after he had given a reading in, in, in San Francisco, and I said, you know, I, had, I'm, I was friends with your first student, we were first doctoral student, uh, Chuck Yerkes, and I remember he had some problems with his dissertation, and he started shaking. Uh, uh, Cornell West started shaking, and then he went, he went, oh yes, yes, brother Chuck. He was an unusual brother. Okay, so. <laughs> Chuck uh, spoke German. Uh, and Russian and everything he had all learned for the army and then continued learning um, and uh, was the cultured person really the most cultured person around our family he was also a minister which I don't know if I mentioned Presbyterian minister and uh, when my father was in the hospital in Columbia Presbyterian there really there wasn't any I mean it doesn't sound that Jewish but um, when my father was in the hospital after his stroke and was being cared for uh, Chuck had to speak to me. And uh, Chuck at the time, he was, he was preaching uh, down in Greenwich Village and he'd gotten a, it's a parsonage or something? I don't know, the house that you get if you're the preacher. And, um, but what he had done, and he said he wanted to tell me something, two things about my father, that he had to tell me, that he had to tell me. You know, and the implication was before my father died, 
he had to tell him. And so I, I went down to, uh, to where Chuck was and um, he had turned his house into, it was at the time, in, uh, really into kind of a hospice for young men with AIDS. Uh, it was, Chuck himself was gay and, um, and would later die, die of AIDS himself. Uh, and at the time, he was taking care of all these, these young men uh, who were so thin, and, and he would care for them and nurture them and, and kvetch at them. And, and, and then I remember he was sitting in a bathrobe, and he sat, he sat in the kitchen, and, and, and I felt like I'm surrounded by ghosts. And, and he said, uh, I have to tell you these two things about your father. So here are the two things. The two things are, first, Stalin. Before I was born in 59, a few years before that were the Khrushchev revelations. A big deal to communists. Not a big deal initially because they didn't exist. They didn't believe them originally. There was a report that came to the American communists that Khrushchev had denounced, that the premier of Russia, of the Soviet Union, had denounced Stalin. And people here did not believe it, from what I can tell. And then there was a point, and this was, I think, when I was very young or before I was born, there was a point at which it was, it became clear that it, the translation was accurate. That Khrushchev had actually said that thing. You know, it was, I guess, as if, you know, the people with the polls, the Republican pollsters who thought Romney was ahead, and it was like, where all of a sudden they went, oh my God, Fox is twisting things. You know, it was like, but it was, Devastating. So the first thing Chuck wanted to tell me is this. My father came down the hallway. Chuck lived down the hallway from us in East 7th Street. And he said that my father sat next to him on the bed and cried all day, sobbed for a full day when the news of, the, of Khrushchev's revelations came down. And then what my father kept saying between sobs was, how could Khrushchev lie like that? That was the first thing he wanted to tell me. And this, the second thing that he wanted to tell me that was very important to him, and I didn't understand, maybe I don't even still, he wanted me to know that my father's and my mother's communism was from their Jew Jewishness. And this was a, a surprising thing for me to hear from him because he himself, of course, was not Jewish, but also because why? I mean, and also he was a communist and he wasn't, and, and yet it was very important to him. Very important for, him, for me to know this thing, Chuck, who had no children of his own. So, so I got to know this rabbi, right? you know, this really sweet rabbi, Menachem. And, and uh, you know, he has this, this definition of God that I can plug into because I have no experience of God. I, know, I mean, I do have an experience of a dramatic gesture like that, actually. <laughs> but, but you know what I mean. I have no experience of a being. I simply have not experienced. There may be, <laughs> but I have no experience of one. I no belief in miracles that violate the laws of physics, um, although physics violates the laws. I understand that, but uh, that's another conference. Okay. Uh, what I started to feel was this. I'm a religious Jew. I've been going to show not a lot, but I fasted now twice two Yom Kippur's in a row, including coffee, <laughs> including, not including Lipitor because I got a dispensation, but including, because apparently Lipitor was actually mentioned in the Torah as being something that you can, you know, they said, because going way back, there was a lot of cholesterol uh, in, <laughs> in the diet. Uh, and so, so I fasted and I went to a service and I was very moved and very proud and I wore a kippah, which, I'm pretty sure is the same as a yarmulke, but that was really <laughs> only came to me when I was in the Jewish store, and there was only one category. Uh, I also I have next to uh, my my bro little brother Sam, uh, who is ailing, uh, gave me uh, the mezuzah thing <laughs> that you put up. I really I tell you I'm, when I say this when I say Jewish things I instinctively recoil from them in a way. I instinctively pull back from them as if to communicate to you quickly that I am not one of those. And yet, I am. 
I had this experience where I was booked to uh, speak at the JCC in San Francisco to a group of, of, of a very, another conference. It was a, a group, but it was of, of secular Judaism with, uh, um, David Beal was there, and I'm just gonna name drop Jewish stuff. Uh, Rachel was there, and also Moses. Uh, and uh, <laughs> Moses couldn't get a word in edgewise because of Rachel, uh, but uh, if you know her. But no, um, that's actually pretty accurate. But um, also, he was, he, he was circumcised with speech, as I've learned, uh, which is a weird, yeah, so. Um, what am I saying? I was booked to give a talk about what it is like, and presumably entertaining and humorous, unlike this one, about, uh, about what it was like to be a secular Jew, raised by secular Jews, how I'm a secular Jew, I'm an atheist secular Jew. And I went up to talk to him, and I looked at him, sitting there, all these secular Jews, and I went, you know, I just don't know. I think maybe there's a God. <laughs> but I don't know. And then when I said it, I thought, oh, it just doesn't, no. No, probably not. No, but maybe. No. So that was like for an hour. I just was <laughs> stuck there between believing and not believing. But I think is I believe, I believe. And so now when I hear atheists on the radio, I'm an atheist. I am. But I hear atheists on the radio, I go, yeah, you're religious. You are. You, you, you are. You're an atheist. You're that kind of a theist. You're an a, a. A is the note that the oboe tunes the orchestra to, and one of the things that, um, uh, this is uh, oboe. The oboe without the reed uh, has a very delicate sound. Um, really doesn't vary very much. It's, uh, I mean, there are five John Cage pieces I just played for you right now, but, but when you want to get to like the more, Rigorous box sort of things, uh, not so much. The first thing I learned about the oboe, one of the two things, two things. One, the duck in Peter and the Wolf. I'm going to get to that. It's actually not that easy to play, so like, don't get your hopes up. The other thing uh, is that the oboe tunes the orchestra. And this is in a time now, well, of course, there, are, there is the technology. You don't need to have an oboist tune the orchestra, and yet the oboe tunes the orchestra. Now, I had been mugged. And the question had been raised, what, aside from the violin, or let's say any string instrument, would you like to play? <laughs> and my godmother, Edith Solomon, whom I hadn't thought of in so many years, uh, she took me to uh, Leonard Bernstein, uh, to, uh, to Lincoln Center, to see um, his young people's concerts, uh, which were extraordinary. Um, with the New York Philharmonic. And I was trying to think, well, what instrument do I play? Because I must play an instrument in order to be valid. And, uh, and I saw, and was it that the oboe tuned the orchestra? Why the oboe? I mean, the oboe, and I've heard different explanations for why the oboe tunes the orchestra. One is that the oboe doesn't have any choice in a sense that, um, it does, you can't really adjust the oboe's tone. Well, once you, you're playing A on the oboe, there's not very much you can do with an oboe, unlike, let's say, a violin. You can tune it, you know, up or down. But the oboe, you're pretty much, so basically, it's just, it's sort of by default. Like, well, you know, I'm, I'm running at this pace, so everyone, I am the pace setter. Uh, you must all now run with me. And the thing that I learned when I tuned the orchestra, when I was in the Youth Symphony Orchestra of New York myself, not to brag, but... Um, <laughs> There aren't that many people who auditioned, really. Uh, <laughs> what I learned is that uh, it's fiendishly difficult to tune the orchestra, at least with the oboe, because at least for me, for someone who's not that good, who didn't practice, um, didn't have a steady enough embouchure, lip uh, musculature, the A would change every time I played it. And the thing is, you don't just play it once for the whole orchestra. You play it for the first violins, you play it for the second violins, you play it for the tubas, you play, you play it. Frankly, I don't know if the tubas ever really listen, but, but you play it for everybody over and over. So you play, uh, you play A a number of times. Each time you play it. You play A, and it's A440. It's A440. It's 440 hertz, and it does. <laughs> they look at you. They look at you with anger. They say, wait, that's not the A you gave them. You gave us, the A you just gave us is a completely different A. 
It might as well be a, an F. The thing that you just gave us. We don't believe you. And yet, you have the authority vested in you by the institution of the orchestra. They must follow your A. And yet, if I'm to be honest, if the, everyone follows each A I give, they will be playing different A's. They'll be playing something very advanced <laughs> instead of Tchaikovsky. So, <laughs> and so I mentioned this to Bill Bennett. I want to say this because I saw Bill Bennett a couple of months ago and I mentioned this to him and I said, you know, I wish I had been, for one reason I wish I had been a better old voice is just to have gotten away from the terror, the terror of being wrong of being the one who was tuning the orchestra and of being wrong to everybody. And he said, it's true for every oboist, it's true for me. He said, Bill Bennett said to me, he said, every time I tune the orchestra, I can tell out of the corner of my eye, I can tell from the way they're looking at me if they buy my A or they don't buy my A. He says, it's the most stressful part of every rehearsal, is tune the orchestra. And yet, the oboe tunes the orchestra. Why? The other thing that the oboe was, uh, was uh, the, 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 the duck, the duck and Peter and the wolf. Uh, Peter and the wolf, uh, I listened to it over and over, over and 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 over, and it was really scary. And just, I'm gonna cut to the chase because you know, this isn't really a performance of that, but um, the wolf is really bad. And at one point, you probably knew that, uh, the wolf eats the, the duck. Now the wolf eats the duck. Now, the thing about this is that the wolf eats the duck, and I'm gonna ruin it for some of you who are gonna you know, be hearing it for the first time in the future, because you're gonna cry, you're gonna miss the duck, and then you're gonna say, wow, and then you're gonna find out something. The duck did not die. The wolf did not chew the duck. The wolf just swallowed the duck. So the duck could be heard from inside the wolf Piano, pianissimo. And eventually, the implication being that eventually was going to come back out through some means or another, <laughs> which showed a certain hardiness. Uh, almost, uh, if I could say, um, where's that thing where you don't die? That thing. Not dyingness, I believe is the word. Immortality. Immortality. That's the thing I miss, immortality. I miss it, because I thought it was there through communism. See, this read might suck. Uh, I have three, <laughs> the thing about reads is that you're, you're always making reads. You're making reads all the time, and you always have a number of reads, because your read, this is the read. Um, I've, I'm going to do this in the eventual show that I'm going to do once it's directed and stuff, you know, and you'll look back on this, you'll think, wow, it's really come a long way in a short time. Uh, <laughs> but the, the read uh, is, the oboe is made, oh, so this is what happened. I was reading Exodus, and, and I thought it was the Red Sea that they crossed. They meaning the Israelites, by the way. I mean, the, the Egyptians started crossing, but the Israelites got all the way, I mean, it wasn't like any, I mean, it was, the Red Sea is what I knew it, and that made sense to me as well, being a Red, that it was sort of a central thing, because I felt biblical. But in the translation that I read, which is by Robert Alter, with whom I have had lunch, <laughs> it is called the Sea of Reeds. So I said, well, why is it called the Red Sea in some books, and then in your translation, it's called the Sea of Reeds? And he said to me, and this is hard, because he's you know, eating squid and stuff, but for what I could make out, he, he loves squid. He said the sea, he said it's because, Einsolf? Is that right? What is Sea of Reeds? Einsolf. Einsolf. I haven't got it. It's not through chapter 15 of Pimsler. You can invite a, a young woman to have a, a little drink with you. But you cannot cross the Sea of Reeds or talk about it yet. Uh, anyhow, he said... Well, the reason I call it Sea of Reeds in my translation, Josh, is because the words are the Sea of Reeds. So, um, you know, and I said, well, there's a certain virtue in that explanation. Um, what I don't get is why do people also have, have that they called it the Red Sea? And at which point he and other people, they have started to talk in English, a language that I'm, I'm good in. 
And I do not follow it. I do not follow how, but there was something about, well, they thought it was the Red Sea. They thought maybe it was the Red Sea where they cross. And the thing when you follow in the map and they're moving around in the Exodus and they cross the thing, and like, that's the Red Sea. That's what we call the Red Sea, but it's called the Sea. There's something, is, there's a cover up or something. Why there, it was like the Red Sea Corporation needed branding or something. It was, um, it's the Sea of Reeds. And when I saw that, I thought, ah, I have wanted to do a monologue about playing the oboe for many, many years so that I will be forced to practice the oboe again, which I haven't done, I haven't played it since I was a kid or since I was a young man. But the problem, there are two problems with doing a monologue about playing the oboe. One is that when you're playing the oboe, it's incredibly hard to talk. The second thing is, uh, the second thing is I really just didn't know what I would say about it. Uh, and then I saw, I'm reading, and I'm reading Exodus. I didn't mention this, I was training for my bar mitzvah. Oh, this is important, this may be the heart of the story, this is the key. I'm surprised that like you guys didn't make me go to that right away. Is I got I've been bar mitzvahed. I'm a man. I mean, I understand now. I understand this is something. Even like, I'm going to say like. Pentecostal ministers will say this to me. Even though it's usually just Jews, but just to make a point, I'm exaggerating. But if I say I was bar mitzvahed at 52, I wasn't bar mitzvahed at 13. Anyone, anyone, uh, um, a talking. A uh, seal, which there used to be one in Boston, would say to me, you were a bar mitzvah when you turned 13. You do know that. So I know that. I know I was a bar mitzvah. But I just really would like to feel special about this bar mitzvah that I had at 52, which is four times the age you're supposed to be. And wait uh, as well. I asked Menachem, I said, will you train me for a bar mitzvah? And he said, yes. And he said, why don't we do it in Israel? And the thing about Israel is that Israel was in my family uh, the enemy. I mean, worse than Trotskyites. Worse, worse than for my father than my mom or than my mom for my father. Israel was, and Zionism was the wrong way that some people had gone as opposed to the right way, which was the communist way. And uh, so when I called my mom in Chicago two years ago and said, I'm, I'm going to get bar mitzvah, I was like, I was already bad enough. You know, are you sitting down? It was like, I mean, I'm her only kid, so I, I can't really be the black sheep. Well, I can, but then there's just one sheep. So essentially, you're just, you're redefining your flock, essentially. Um, and they said, I'm going to do it in Israel. My mom, oh, that's, that's interesting. <laughs> that's interesting. And, and I've had these experiences, and I, I don't know, maybe I've noticed this. Maybe you guys, I don't know if this is just me, but I've had the experience of talking about Israel, speaking of Israel, I have had the experience that some people get very emotional uh, about it and argue. And um, I am hoping not to engender that. Uh, I got, when I send out my emails, they say I'm gonna go to Israel to get bar mitzvah, I got a number of uh, emails uh, from Jews around Berkeley saying how could you. Uh, without going to the occupied territories, or only to the occupied territories. And then I got a few emails uh, saying, how could you? No, actually, mostly people were pretty supportive. But it would have been a great story if people were against it. Um, <laughs> the fact is this. I had never had any interest in going to Israel. I'd been to the Promised Land when I was a teenager. I'd been to the Soviet Union. <laughs> and yet I agreed to go. And I agreed to go with my family and with a group of people who signed up from my e-list and from the Shul's e-list, 18 of us, including the rabbi and his family, his young children, and his wife. Well, he's young too. I mean, they're all children. Uh, and, uh, and me and my wife and my son, who was turning about to turn 13. Um, we went to Israel for me to be bar mitzvahed uh, the summer before this previous summer. And um, wow. I was recording this for no reason at all, and it said card full. And, and I thought, you know, maybe the old ways, you know, are better. Uh, so, the Sea of Reeds. Now, here's the thing. When you, when you play the oboe, you, uh, let me know if my time's up, by the way. Is my time up? Because I, I haven't really, I haven't, like, totally gone through this very carefully plotted art. Okay. So, uh, Arundo Donax is the reed, it's the cane, it's the species of cane from which all woodwind reeds are made. Charlie Parker blew on Arundo Donax, uh, as did Benny Goodman, 
as do all oboists and all bassoonists. Um, it grows in places like the Sea of Reeds. Uh, you get it as an oboist, you get it like this. It's cut from, it's like a bamboo thing, and then it's cut into sections, and then you get these sections, so you can see the whole probably, it's a sort of staging problem without projections and stuff. And then just to give you a quick idea, this is just to give you an idea of what oboists do. You split it with a splitter, which, you know, makes sense. Oh, here it is. It's a splitter. It's a splitter. And you split it. Um, I'm actually going to do it. Uh, no one should be hurt. Uh, well, you probably won't. Well, you can oh. I, I can't. Okay. I'm going to split it. Ready? Okay, here we go. Okay, here we go. Split. Oh, split. Actually, cool. Well, actually, okay. So it splits. It's supposed to split into three, but it actually splits into one and two. But... This is cool, this is what you want. You want to get this thing, which is the split. So now you have this. And then you put in something which I couldn't bring with me because I rode my bike and then took Caltrain, but it's a gouger. You put in a pre-gouger and a gouger so that this part is hollowed out. This part is hollowed out. Then, then you fold it over a shaper. You fold it over a shaper and you, it turns into something that looks like this. You fold it so that now that's the middle. Then you sew this part, you tie it onto a piece of cork on a tube, and you tie it, and then you cut the tip. So now the tip, you see, the tip, the part I blow, the part that makes the sound, was the middle. And here's the thing that I want to tell you. I have an oboe teacher, not Bill, who I just saw for a couple times, but I have this oboe teacher named Peter Lemberg, who's really wonderful, and he said this thing to me, because once you tie it on and you cut the tip, it becomes what is called a blank. You scrape it a little bit and it's called a blank. And then my oboe teacher said to me, you must leave it. You must leave it for a day. You'll be tempted now, because you're very close to finishing the read. You must not finish it now. I said, why? He said, because think about it. It was growing. It was cut down. Then it was dried out, it was transported. You gouged it, you've shaped it, you've cut into it, you've changed it, you've changed it. And it, it needs some time to try to become what it was. He was just telling me an oboe fact. <laughs> but the blank needs some time to become what it was, <laughs> to try, but it won't. It can't, it's too late. So what can it be? Edith Solomon, my godmother, uh, had uh, been liberated from Auschwitz and uh, was very, very, very thin. I'm thinking back now many, many years now to before I would have had a bar mitzvah and I'd had a bar mitzvah. And uh, she played, I believe, the flute. And even at the time, I recall her being something of uh, almost not there. Um, and we saw Leonard Bernstein conduct uh, New York Philharmonic with its fabulous oboist. I'm sure all of you can name the first oboist at the time at the New York Philharmonic, Harold Gomberg. Some of you might have said his brother, Ralph Gomberg, but that was Boston. Okay, I'm going to do this better, but it's really hard and I'm just warming up. It's low. It's about as low. I mean, it's not totally, but it's, it's just, Prokofiev was just a, like a, a, a sadist. <laughs> Okay, this read. No, and the thing about reads, okay, so you make your reads and you, you are always making reads. Professional oboists are always making reads and they only last, uh, they have a lifetime maximum of about ten, uh, eight hours of playing. Uh, that's because what happens is that you're, uh, if nothing else gets to them, the enzymes in your saliva 
break down the wood and then they, they stop playing, uh, they stop working. Um, they get softer and softer and softer, but also most reeds don't work. So Bill Bennett, like any great oboist I knew or any professional oboist, had his reed desk with all of his reed stuff and was always making reeds. He'd be practicing oboe a bunch of the day and then he'd be making reeds a bunch more of the day, making many, many reeds and only one or two out of like, let's say 10 or 20 would be suitable for playing. And he was good, right, good at it. So the idea is that you have to make just a lot of reeds. You have to be making reeds, and it's really hard to make reeds. And I'm just gonna, I'm, I'm just an amateur. These are the reeds I'm working on now. These are just some of the reeds, and these all suck. They, one of them, but mostly no. The reed is fragile. And yet the reed is the voice. The reed produces the sound. The reed is the voice. It's the voice box of the oboe. It really is the reed. The oboe is there to kind of get the reed out into the world. Is it Jewish? Fragile, delicate, beset, finicky, neurotic. The last three were me. I'm gonna, but the one advantage is, of course, I mean, you don't really have a violinist say, you know, this bow. Uh, but with oboists, you can do the reed, you know, because it, it really is, if you can't, okay. Okay, I, I got through it. When, I, you know, when I was back in my apartment, I was doing this really well. So that's like, that's a duck, you know? And then he's gonna get eaten. And then he's gonna come out again. Probably needing a new reed. I had to um, study for my bar mitzvah. And the, the, my parsha was, uh, if that's the word I want. See, I, okay, it's not just that I'm trying to be like, to be what I was. I know I can't be what I was. What I was, was a young boy who believed completely in the ideology in which I was raised, in the faith in which I was raised. I believed in it totally, and we had great music, and we were right, and everyone else was wrong, and there were only a tiny group of us, which was proof that we were right, because, you know, would more than a few people know the truth? No. So that was me. That's who I was. And now what I am now, what I believe now, I don't, I was thinking of this on Caltrain, as I'm sure everyone else was on Caltrain. Uh, it evokes spiritualism. Uh, <laughs> is, I was thinking is that I don't, and I don't, I don't feel like I have faith. This is what I have, I don't have faith. What I have access to, I don't have access to faith because I don't believe in faith. I admire faith. I would love to have faith. But what I aspire to is habit. And what I realized was, when I was a kid, I would go to these oboe lessons, right? I had great teachers, great teachers. Merrill Greenberg, Henry Schumann, um, just to name two. Those are my two teachers. And uh, Merrill Greenberg still playing English horn in, uh, in Israel, uh, and, uh, and Henry Schumann gone. Um, and I didn't practice. And I didn't practice, and I didn't practice, and I didn't practice, and I would hope, I would hope, and in a way, secularly pray, that I would become a week better at the oboe by the time of my next lesson, even though I hadn't practiced. This hasn't happened, this didn't happen. And eventually my oboe teacher, Henry Schumann, fired me. He said, that's enough. He didn't even have to say why. And then I started going to shul, and I decided I was gonna go every week, you know, and then, you know, it happened. But then I thought, well, but at least I'll practice oboe every day. So it's a little bit weird uh, how it's working out, but here's the thing. When I practice every day, I feel it. I feel it change. I feel myself change. I feel my oboe playing change. I mean, you should have heard me before. And what I've uh, been practicing um, is a very Jewish sounding to me book uh, that I picked up uh, called Difficult Passages. It's a book called Difficult Passages. That's the kind of thing that, to me, a Jewish person would choose. Uh, 
you know. Um, it also, to me, is, was instantly evocative of, of the Sea of Reeds. Uh, a mir miraculous, it was a miracle, a, a miracle. They crossed, it said, I read it. I read it in the translation. They crossed the Sea of Reeds. They were amid the sea, but on dry land. They were in the sea, but they were on dry land. I know I've seen the movie. I've seen the documentary with Charlton Heston, but <laughs> imagining back, they were in the sea on dry land, and they can't. They can't. It's not possible. It's not possible. And should it be possible that so many Jews love to play Bach? Cantata number 82, Ich habe genug. This also uh, spoke to me because genug was something that my father would say a lot. Uh, usually, you know, about things he would wish to have enough of. Uh, genug meaning enough. Or he would say, and I, this is now I, I believe I've ventured into Yiddish, genug shen, he would say, meaning really enough. Um, Genug uh, shame. A lot of times I remember this would have to do with uh, ordering the elevator. We lived on the sixth floor and the elevator would be broken just fairly all the time. And uh, genug, like enough of this life in which you press the button and the elevator does not come. Genug. But ich habe genug is, um, Bach turns out was uh, not a Jew, but, uh, <laughs> but a Lutheran. Uh, which is sort of like the Jew, I, mean, you know, I was going to say the Jews of, of Protestantism, but that was just, uh, I was just going to try to say that. Um, and, I, I, uh, and it's from the purification of the Blessed Virgin Mary, uh, which again doesn't sound super Jewish. Um, and the lyrics, which are in German, are uh, translated to English, are I, a sample. I have now enough. I have now my savior, the hope of the faithful, within my desiring embrace now enfolded. I have now enough. On him I have, I ha have I gazed. My faith now hath Jesus impressed on my heart. I would now, today yet, with gladness, make hence my departure. Um, kind of down. <laughs> and yet, I totally dig it. And one reason I dig it, and I don't really have time to go into this because there really isn't time for the stuff I have to go into. <laughs> um, that doesn't involve, you know, some sort of rigorous Freudian uh, therapy, uh, is uh, this. What is it that I don't have time to get into? Okay. So, Ich habe genug. Um, this introduces, this is the, the oboe introduces uh, in the piece. I'm going to have other people, I didn't mention this. My piece is not going to be a monologue uh, that opens in, in July. It's going to be my first non-monologue. I didn't realize you could have a theater piece that had more than one person, but apparently it's been experimented with and uh, there are some promising results. Uh, and so I'm gonna have musicians and uh, uh, oh, the Sea of Reeds, it was a difficult, they had to cross the Sea of Reeds, it's, it's a paradox. Oh, this, yes, we were in Israel. And the thing is, I cannot talk to Menachem about Israel and it's not his fault, it is because he loves Israel, and I kind of love Israel, I'm trying to love Israel, I'm getting into Israel, I'm learning Hebrew, Ivrit, it's Hebrew for Hebrew, and, and yet, I feel when I raise it, I am violating all kinds of taboos around him because, because I was, that's not how I feel. Except when I was there, I started to feel that way a little bit, but just a little bit. Wow, I really need to go into this with more articulation. <laughs> and this is what the rabbi said to me. He said to me once, and it wasn't about Israel. This is what he said. He said a group of rabbis once got, like not once, like once, this isn't like back in the, the Middle Ages. This is like, you know, the 90s. A group of rabbis got together for a conference, and it's not a joke either, which it sounds like, and then they get into a boat, and then they go to a bar. It was actually a group of rabbis at a conference and uh, their conference was to try to figure out, is it better or worse for the world that people came? Is it better or worse that there were people? My wife, Sarah, Sarah Leah Sato, uh, Warner Brandeis, Japanese American. <laughs> My wife believes that it was maybe not good for humans to have been here on balance 
given the evidence. The rabbis came to that conclusion. This is what they concluded. The rabbis met, according to Menachem, and they came to this conclusion. Perhaps it would have been better for the world if there had been no people. However, there are people. We are here, and so how shall we make the best of it? And I believe <laughs> that we'll make the best of it. Okay, I'm gonna just gonna cut to the chase here, and I'm gonna play a little box and I'm gonna get the hell out of here. Because Caltrain doesn't run all night. Um, although it should. Uh, I believe in, I believe, and this is the thing that's come back to me, okay, this is what I believe, this is not artful. I believe that the purpose in my life, I believe two things about the purpose of my life. One is love. I believe love, loving and being loved. But the thing that I believe that connects my upbringing with my new studies in Judaism as a religious Jew is that I believe that the meaning of my life is through seeking justice for people who do not have power, who do not have agency. That's what I believe. That's what I believe. And yet, if I'm understanding what I've heard when I've gone to shul correctly, believing that will do nothing, but doing, acting, will make me a Jew. Keep going, but I just want to mention um, just a little further. He was an excellent composer, um, <laughs> Bach. Um, this is a really important thing, and I would have worked it in artfully and will eventually. But in a footnote, it was all about the footnotes to me in this translation, pretty much all about the footnotes. And in a footnote, I learned that the word, the Hebrew word, at least in biblical Hebrew, for wind and breath and spirit are the same word. Which means, if I'm understanding it, that to someone who was hearing it in the original language, that they could be hearing, certainly at least in one level and one layer, that it was the spirit that was parting the sea and not necessarily the wind. And it was doing it all night. So it took a long time. And the thing that distinguishes the oboe, and the reason why I'm just hoping this is really relevant, the thing that distinguishes the oboe is that unlike any other instrument, as far as I know, any other wind instrument, you cannot Get rid of all your wind through the oboe. You can't. You would be dead. I was told that by an oboe teacher. If you expelled all the air out of your lungs through the reed, through the oboe, at that point, you would be dead. So, you know, uh, a pyrrhic victory. Uh, so this is what you do. You have to release air as you play. Release the stale air because you still need to breathe because you're still an aerobic person, an aerobic being. It was described by one oboist in this way, and the rabbi was quite taken with this, so I wanted to share it with you. The oboist, this is a former first oboist of the New York Philharmonic, not Harold Gomberg, the more recent one. He said, think of the wind as this. Think of when you take a sponge and you fill the sponge and it's completely engorged with, with water, then you squeeze it, and you squeeze it, and then it's still a little damp, right? He didn't say right. He said, it's still a little damp. OK, the analog is this. When you play the oboe, what he said, the wind that you want to use, the wind, or shall I say, maybe spirit, that you want to use is not the full spirit. It's not the full wind. It is, in fact, what is left. It is what is left. And what this particular oboist recommends is that you do this, which I'm going to do, and finish this thing. What he recommends is instead of doing, which is totally intuitive, is to because you really got to blow hard to play the oboe. He said, instead of that, breathe out. 
until you have breathed all the way out as far as you can tell, and then play. That's the wind you use. How did the Israelites cross? What was the miracle? Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you all for coming. That was wonderful. Um, this is part of a larger conference, so those of you who are you might ask people oh, to turn off their phones. Yes. <laughs> um, those of you who are part of the larger conference, uh, please stay. We will uh, have dinner next. Those of you who are not part of the conference, I apologize for not having dinner for you all. Uh, but tonight at 8 o'clock, uh, the conference is going to continue with another public event, a conversation with novelist Gary Steingart. So we hope you'll come back for that. That's going to be in the geology building, which is over there somewhere. And um, we hope to see you there. So thank you very much, and thank you again so much. Thank you.